Home and Broma and your older brother Patrick, were these the two biggest factors, do you think, in getting you involved in the sport of hockey? <laughs> yeah, pretty much so. Uh, it's simple as that, I think. You, when you're a kid, you always look up to your older brother and want to do what he's doing, and he starts skating, walking down to the, to the lake, and uh, I followed them. So, as simple as that, that, that's how I start playing hockey for sure. How did uh, Patrick handle your success as the two of you got older? He got very upset really? <laughs> at the start, no. Um, he, he was better than me for all, but I actually, around 12 or 13, I was a lot better than he was as a player too. So we were, there was always fight, in, uh, always like brothers fight, I think, but uh, in a good way. He used to beat me up and I took it out on my younger brother and he didn't have anyone after that. So uh, all in good spirit and, and uh, we had a great uh, growing up. My, our parents drove us everywhere. All three of us played hockey and played any sports that we wanted to. So we were uh, very fortunate. How active beyond the driving were your parents? Did they have to push you at any time in terms of steering you in a proper direction when maybe you needed it? I, I think they did in, in, in a critical time, I remember actually being uh, 14, 15. I think there's a there's a time, there's a window there where uh, when you grow up where all of a sudden you get the interest of, of girls and there's your other, your friends are starting to go out on weekends and you're, you have to go yourself to the hockey rink at 10 on a Saturday night. So I think my parents at that point said, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to be there and drive you all over the place, we need you to focus on your school and, you know, we want, if you want to continue to play hockey, we want you to put a good effort in, otherwise you're going to have to do it yourself, so. They, they helped out when it was kind of a, a crit, critical hump to get over it. They did a great job. Is there uh, one of the parents that you get your personality from? Or are you a bit of both, do you think? I say more my mom, actually. I think my dad's the softer, the softer uh, one. And I, I think my mom is, is, she's a little tougher, actually, and has got a uh, stronger will. So I, I think I'm more like my mom, actually. And a lot of us would find that surprising because our perception of you is as a, a lower keyed person that, and certainly strong, but uh, not as loud and, and out there as perhaps uh, some other hockey players we've known in Toronto. Would you agree with that? <laughs> I, I would agree with that, but I, I think there's a, to me, a strong and, or, or a quiet and, and um, the way you're saying, I don't think, I think having the drive and all that is inside too. It's something you build up and that's that you, learn as you grow up too and I think I've always had that even though I've, you know, I've been uh, soft spoken. That great backhand that you brought to Toronto, where did it find its beginnings way back when in Sweden? <laughs> I think I've learned it as my career went on. Or I had coaches as young tell me you need to be able to shoot both ways, have a good uh, a right hand shot, but also be good with the backhand. And then turning pro, I actually learned to play with a little bit of a straighter stick in the beginning of my career, and that helped me work on my backhand too. So. And a lot of practice, just like anything else. There's no real secrets. You need to practice a lot. There was always talk uh, in Toronto that maybe you would have been better used on the wing, oh, as good <laughs> as you were in the middle. Uh, I'm sure you didn't want that to happen. Uh, did you ever consider playing the wing as opposed to playing down the center? I did start off my career as so playing on the right wing, and I didn't have a problem with that. I, I think in, in the National Hockey League, if you want to have the puck a lot as a forward, I think you need to play at center. And, it's just a different way of game when you're on the wing. You're, there's uh, more parts of the time of the game where you're kind of actually waiting or try to get in a position. You don't hold the puck or control the play. Where, as a center, you get involved in the play right from the back from your own end, and you're more the go-to guy to give the puck and, and control the play. That's why I kind of like to play center. And I think I had my best years uh, both in the national team and as a uh, in the NHL as a as a centerman as well. It's hard to think of you at one point as being a Montreal Canadian fan, but I think Matt Snazlin had that effect on you. Tell me about your idolization for him and, and how important he was to you as a young man. <laughs> Matt Snazlin was a huge idol. Obviously, Boris Salman growing up, uh, I enjoyed watching. Kent Nelson, who was an unbelievable talent to play in the National Hockey League, too, was 
with people that I, I idolize. And when I grew up, we didn't, we wasn't able to watch the NHL so much. It was more the national team, but those guys were far away on a, in a different league, and it was tough even to dream about being able to get there. You had a chance to play against all three of these guys. Uh, that had to be a thrill. Yeah, and, and with them too in yeah. the national team, all three of them. And um, I told Matt Snesler when, when the first time I was with the national team that he was my idol and a uh, big thrill. And uh, that's one of those things that, that <clears throat> keeps you driving hard, I think, and, and makes you realize that you succeed too when you get to the point where you're actually playing with your idols. It's a great feeling. Was it both the age of 17 that uh, a possible career in the National Hockey League, uh, League took root with you, do you think? I think so. And. Um, as I said, it's a criti critical time, I think, when you're 15, 16, whether or not you're going to continue to play hockey or, or continue to do something else. And, and uh, I did get some recognition when you're 16, 17. You, you get to represent Sweden in certain uh, junior national team tournaments and so forth, and all of a sudden you have some scouts to come and see you, and you can kind of get a feeling that maybe there's something more than just playing in Sweden and, and uh, representing your, your hometown. So, yeah, I would say around 17, it, it, it was an uh, important time. And you get a chance, before you come to North America, to play as a teenager with grown men in your garden. How much of a transition was that for you? I would say it was critical for me, and at the time, Jurgen was by far the best team in Sweden. A lot of older players, some of them uh, former NHL players, and they were actually very hard on me when I broke in there, and being a number one pick almost at the time, too. They, uh, they taught me that it's not only about talent. They really helped me work on to get physically strong enough to play in the highest level against men. And also an attitude to come to the rink and, and work hard every time and have a good attitude. So they really, my, f my only year with Jurgarden really helped me to, get, to raise the level of my game and, and the standard. You win a championship that year? We won the Swedish championship, and uh, not much because of me. I think I played, uh, I was dressed 34 games out of 40, played on the third line, and uh, got to play a lot in the playoffs. I scored seven goals in nine games in the playoffs, but the coach said he, he saved me for the playoffs. He didn't play me a whole lot during the regular season, but great experience, and it really helped me uh, uh, when I turned pro. And you get noticed in North America. How much of an eye-opener was the 1989 draft in Minneapolis for you and your dad who made the <laughs> trip over to the States? It, it was an eye-opener for, for Sweden, I think. And, and no one really in hockey realized what the draft was. It was the first time I think a Swedish player actually went to the draft. And um, I remember going with my agent, my, agent, my father, and, and it was all new for us. And it was new for the media in Sweden, actually. It, it w became big news, but it was a learning experience for, for Sweden as a hockey country, too. Were you comfortable with the expectations that went with the first ever European going first overall? I mean, you were a pioneer, much like Boreal was in his time. And not until you get, yeah, I got to Quebec City, where, where I started my career, I realized what hockey means in Canada, too. It's, it's, a, it's what soccer is in, in, in Spain or in Italy or in, in England. There's a culture and a religion and a tradition there that we don't have in Sweden the same way. Sweden is a great sports country, but it's more a general, different kinds of sports, and, and uh, Canada is a lot more focused on hockey. The Swedes as well, personality-wise, and I don't know if this is the way all of you are brought up, but the culture is different. You're not as out there. You're very gracious, very understated. Uh, did that, <laughs> do you think that caught a lot of us over here, the North American media, by surprise? I, I think it's in, in uh, good, good and bad. I think mm -hmm. it's not only great with that. Um, I, I think a lot, you're right, I think a lot of Swedes are very uh, drawn back and, and uh, modest and don't say a whole lot. I think it's a different thing when you, when you, and when Swedish players come on the ice, I think you, you have the same drive, the same will to do well and compete and all that. It's just, it just comes in a different package than maybe a, an American and a Russian or many Canadians, you know. Uh, and, and I think that's why a lot of Swedish players are very popular too in teams. They're, they're, you, no, normally very good team guys and, and fits in well in a group. Six Swedes went in the first round in the draft in Minneapolis. They win the World Junior Championship in January. How does a country of eight million people continue to produce such outstanding hockey people and, and personalities? It, it's, an, it's an ongoing process, obviously, but the Swedish 
our soccer federation the last six years have made a real commitment to uh, to work with their with their youth and try to bring in the kids when they're 15, 16 to a program. They, they gather them for the whole country of Sweden, all the best 15, 16 year olds, and they teach them how to train, how to eat, how to prepare to become a good player, and really all the work they need to do to get to the next level. And that's why I think Sweden won the World Juniors this year. They were in the finals uh, the year before that, and uh, are continuing uh, to produce great young players. When you get a chance to settle down just a bit, do you see a future in international hockey for you to give back to Sweden? Uh, you've won world championships, you've won an Olympics. Yeah, I, I, I think I am actually part of the Swedish uh, Ice Hockey Federation and Marketing Committee this year. Sweden hosts uh, uh, world championships in, in Stockholm and in uh, Helsinki and also 2013, so I'm a little bit part of it. Um, it's been nice to take a couple steps back from hockey. It's been so much. It's been consuming my whole life for all as, as long as I lived so far. So I'll always love the, the game of hockey, and I'm sure I'll be back in hockey somehow down the road. But right now, it's been nice to take a few steps back. Let's go back to age 19. You come to Quebec City. How big a transition was that for you, not only as a player but as a person, to come to the city of Quebec and get introduced to the NHL? Well, it, it was a great uh, adventure, uh, leaving the, the room in my, in my parents' house right out in the big world, coming to uh, Canada, and then realized that everybody speak, spoke French. <laughs> uh, but it was great. Young team, I think the average age was 21 or 20 at the time. The guys like Owen Nolan, Joe Sackick, uh, a lot of great players and also great guys off the ice that I, that I played with there for four years. So it was a great experience. You bring a low-key personality. You're a rookie in this league. You're naturally shy, and you've got a fiery personality of a head coach named Pierre Paget. Uh, he drove you hard, didn't he? Uh, yeah, he did. He, he drove everybody hard. He had high expectations on, on all the players. And um, it, we didn't have a great team, I remember, especially in my first two years. Uh, Joe Sackick were very frustrated and, and, uh, and um, in the third year we really turned around and we had a good year. We finished third I think in the Eastern Conference and really had a good start. We ended up losing to Montreal in the mm -hmm. first round but and Montreal went on to win the cup but uh, great memories from the years in Quebec City. And you went 100 points, maybe 104, 114 points. Yeah. So who are your line mates? What made all that possible that year? I played with Valerie Kamensky and uh, I think Owen Nolan most of the time. We had a great line, and, uh, and all, all of us were young, obviously, at that time. I remember one game we were in Hartford, and uh, we beat him actually 11-4, and I think our line had, I don't know what, I had seven points, and Owen had six, and Kevin had five or something like that. We had a, it was easy to play with guys like that. June 28, 1994, you're traded to Toronto. Uh, describe the day as to where you were, what you were doing, and how it all came down. I was actually up in, the, in Lapland, in, above the Arctic Circle, fishing uh, when I got the news. And there, I'll never forget it, we're standing up at a stream out, and it's, all there is is mosquitoes and, and moose pretty much in that area. There's no roads at all, and all of a sudden there's a helicopter that came in with a... With a <laughs> with a reporter from a Swedish paper who, who jumped out and he had some questions and they took off again. <laughs> and then we had another helicopter that came in with Swedish TV. He jumped out and all the mosquitoes, I remember the guy had a t-shirt on and the blood was just dripping off his arms, all the mosquitoes eating him up. So it was, it was, um, it was a big thing. I didn't realize back when I stood there fishing what it, what it meant uh, becoming a Maple Leaf, but I, I understood that when I, when I got to Toronto. Spent time with Borja Salming at his hockey school. What was the advice he had to you coming to Toronto and, and really replacing a legend like Wendell Clark? He was very excited for me. I think he obviously understood what it meant being a Maple Leaf. He gave me, he said that you're going to have a great time, you're going to love the city. It's a different pressure than playing anywhere else, but um, it, was all, it was all compliments and he was really excited for me. How important was he 
in coming to North America and in turn coming to Toronto in terms of paving the way for young Swedish players like yourself? Yeah, Boris Salmon broke, broke the way for, I'd say, not only Swedish players, but European players, the way he played and, and conducted himself as a player. And uh, I remember, especially when I was asked uh, to be the captain for the Leafs, I called Boris Salming and, and uh, talked to him about it, and he, and he said that he was asked to be the captain, and he said no, and he regretted that for the rest of his life. And he said, you have, you have to take it. It's a great honor. It's something you'll, you'll carry, with, carry with you the rest of your life, and I, I have no gr regrets since that, doing that. It was controversial, you coming here. Did it take a while, you think, for Leaf Nation to, to finally accept you? <laughs> It, it was it was different, and I have to admit, the first few years, uh, there's no doubt you have to earn your stripes. And uh, in a market like Toronto, it may be more than some other places. And uh, being a European, Swedish, uh, and also, like you said, replacing uh, a man like Wendell Clark didn't make it easier. But uh, no regrets there either. And um, I think it fits my my personality too that that I want to show that I can fight my way to, to uh, and get earn the people's respect and um, I think it was good for me. September 30th, 97, you're named the captain of this franchise, the 16th captain. Looking back, could you appreciate the significance now, what you might have appreciated back then? Uh, two different <laughs> feelings, do you think, looking back on it? Absolutely. Uh, there's no doubt that you're young and, and uh, hungry and but inexperienced when you're at that age that I was back then. Um, but what a great honor to, to uh, and I, I look back now, when I look at my, my career, I wouldn't trade it away for anything. I wouldn't trade my time with the Toronto Maple Leafs for a, for a Stanley Cup or anything else, uh, and not being the captain either. It's been a great experience for me. I think I am a type of person and a leader that enjoys to get the responsibility of being a captain. I think it helped me as a player. I think it made me a better player and a better teammate. And uh, it has brought me nothing but great things. The leadership qualities that you bring, the class, was this inherent right from day one growing up in Sweden, or was this something you developed as, as you progressed as a hockey player, as a man? I, I think I've actually enjoyed it, and I think, and probably I wasn't thinking about it back then, but uh, I think it's something I've had a quality since I was a kid, actually, and that I enjoyed being in, in, in groups and, and having the a leader role and I've had that with me since since uh, I was a kid actually. What was it like in the early part of the decades leading that veteran hockey club that had so many unique personalities from Ty <laughs> to Eddie, Gary, Joe, Darcy, I can go on and on. That was quite a room. Yeah, that was quite a room. Yeah. Uh, that was quite a lot of different personalities. Um, in a way, I think it's easier with a veteran group. There's no doubt about that. You have guys like Joe Noondike and Gary Roberts and like you said, a lot of experience, guys that have won championships, they know what it takes. I think it's more of a challenge to be a leader in, in a group of younger players, talented players, that you know they you want them to grow and you want them to develop and, and uh, get better. It's more of a challenge, I think. So uh, I think it's been great and I've enjoyed uh, both of them. Fall of 1998, Pat Quinn comes on board. Did you sense that something was about to change, that things were going to get better? Yeah, I, I think when uh, when Curtis Joseph came on board, as you said, Pat Quinn, I think uh, there was a lot of players that were signed. I think um, Ken Dryden and uh, Anders Hedberg and Mike Smith and these guys did a great job build a team, actually. And, and if you look at the way the teams are built today, they were really ahead of the time. They, they, they were looking at guys that were able to skate. They wanted guys that could pass the puck and, and actually contribute, score goals, not only in your first line, but right through your whole lineup. And, and great goaltending, and they made a big effort to, to sign Curtis Joseph, who was one of the best goalies in the league.